Hello. <laughs> My name is R.L. Miller, and as introduced, I wear two hats. The first is that I co-founded a group by the name of Climate Hawks Vote in 2014 to bring grassroots political power to the climate movement. And what... <laughs> What that means in plain terms is that I try to get people elected. And so when, I, when you mentioned Nanette Baragon, I delivered enough votes to help her elect her, to, to help elect her over a conservative, oily Democrat. <laughs> I delivered enough votes to help um, elect a senator who was being primaried from the right in 2014. I've had other electoral successes, but those are two that I'm particularly proud of, and all I can say is that's two down and 533 to go. <laughs> plus the presidency, plus all the state houses, plus all the local offices, plus, okay, I don't actually have any power whatsoever. <laughs> but people think that I do. And I wanna talk about building political power because what you talked about is sort of a raw example of what happens when some of you go in and talk to these hardcore denier folks. I've been in their offices two minutes after you and people like you, and they take your carefully pre prepared fact sheets and they file them in the round file right away. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but what they do respect, and you guys have come a long way, and I wanna say I really like talking to you because for the most part, you are extremely intelligent, motivated, um, and ready to act, and I'm, you know, I think that you guys are doing great work at convincing people that your policies are intelligent. But I wear that other hat where I talk about politics, and so I need to say that you will not be listened to enough unless you bring political power to your meetings. What is political power? It can be a number of things. Um, I wanna start by asking, what is the single thing motivating most politicians? What is, what, what is, what, okay, let me rephrase that. What is, what is the single thing that they fear most? You guys are close. I phrase it a little differently. I say it's job loss. And it's not your job. And it's not your job. It's their own. <laughs> and that's why the Tea Party was so successful in 2010. Be not because they were loud and obnoxious and well-funded, but because they actually caused some Republicans to lose. If you can get to the point where you cause a Democrat to lose, you will be feared, okay? So bringing money, is a, bringing money um, and letting people know that there is money behind you and that you donate a lot of money is one of the ways that you show political power. Another one is by releasing a poll, a poll showing that your ideas have substantial support. And you guys know the polling numbers just like I do, that basically say that solar is like mom and wind is like apple pie, right? Um, another way you, sh you show up with political power is by holding on to a sufficiently large number of petition signatures in your district, okay? So if I, pres I, I was in Diane Feinstein's office on um, Tuesday meeting with her staffers. Her staffers were interested to hear that I had 8,000 signatures on a petition to block Rex Tillerson. Um, <laughs> oh, by the way, how many, anybody here gone to a march in the last week? <laughs> okay, keep your hand up if you've gone to two marches. Keep your hand up if you've gone to three. <laughs> I was at the inauguration march um, in downtown LA. I did a women's march and I led a move on thing in front of Di Fi's office on um, Tuesday. And tomorrow I will be in Pasadena with a march um, regarding defunding the Dakota Access Pipeline. 
And I should do the obligatory social media plug. It's climate hawks, as in the birds, vote, um, if you want to go like us on Facebook. But I will tell you right now, contrary to the, what the nice person said this morning, that if you're serious about politics, get on Twitter, not Facebook. Twitter is what elected our, that, that thing we have. <laughs> OK. Um, I, I want to I talk specifically about the lay of the land in California because you guys are gonna be doing a lot of work in California. And I'm gonna start with what I tell the national groups, which is you guys think of California as this beacon of hope and light, which it is, yes. <laughs> but the simple fact is that if our bills don't pass muster with persons of color, they don't pass, period, full stop. And so I look at this room, and this room is very white, and I looked at the way that you guys had one table set up for environmental justice. And by the way, I think I told you that I, maybe I didn't tell you, I titled this speech Hard Truths. If I haven't annoyed you, I'm not doing it right. <laughs> um, please find your allies within the environmental justice movement and within the broader social justice movement. Right now, there's a protest going on at Los Angeles International Airport, and I really wish I could be there because I haven't done enough protests this week. <laughs> um, it's against the Muslim ban, by the way. Um, yeah, can we get some applause? Can we get a shout out for the Mu against the Muslim ban? Yes, thank you, hello, yes. <laughs> okay, that's better. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, back to California. Um, we have, as I say, we have managed to achieve what Washington State could not, which is a decent working relationship between the uh, persons of color who don't necessarily care about climate justice, but they really care a lot about justice for their communities, and the environmental people. And I'm going to talk occasionally somewhat disdainfully about the white coastal elites um, and the white coastal congressional districts in California. And I'm gonna tell you guys that basically we have, when it comes to climate in California, we have three parties, not two. Did you know that? Yeah. <laughs> um, we have one third or so is, a rep is Republicans. They are flat out Republicans, they advertise as endorsed by the National Republican Party. They are elephants, whatever. We have another roughly one third, maybe a little bit more, who are real Democrats. They, are, they have a D after their name, and they vote Democratic, and they push Democratic climate policies. Then we have another group that is called the Moderate Democrats. They have Ds after their names. You cannot tell them easily apart from the real Democrats. But when I say moderate Democrats, these are the people who killed the petroleum reduction section of SB 350 in 2015, okay? My job in California is to drive them out of the party. <laughs> okay. Another hard fact about these people, the California legislator has 120, 40 in the state senate, 80 in the assembly. Anybody want to guess how many of them have taken oil money? No, not all of them. It's 90. We have a super majority of an oil caucus. Yeah. More in the way of hard facts, our assembly, thanks to the way the term limit law worked, our assembly members are not going anywhere until 2024. They will not, for the most part, they will not be termed out until 2024. Now some of them are gonna retire, some of them are gonna get primaried, but for the most part, when you do your cheat sheets on what my legislator looks like and when you talk about developing a relationship with your assembly member, you will be dealing with that person for the next seven years. So I know you guys are very good about developing those relationships, so work it. <clears throat> um, 
I don't know what to say about the moderate Dems other than that you can try to talk to them reasonably, but the single best thing that I think is going to work on the moderate Dems is knowing that one of them did in fact get primaried, and her name was Cheryl Brown. Why are you guys clapping her? We called her Chevron Cheryl Brown. We backed Eloys. <laughs> we backed Eloise. We backed her. I donated money to her. I talked about her all the time. I did everything I could to skirt the California Democratic Party's law that I'm not supposed to um, back anybody other than the endorsed Democrat because Brown got the party endorsement. I did what I could, um, and ultimately Eloise did prevail. And I want all of you guys to keep that in the back of your mind because the ultimate threat to a Democrat who's not voting your right, the right way is to mount a credible primary challenge, okay? Um, this is harder than writing letters to the editor. And I like what you guys do in the way of le writing letters to the editor, but you need to do more than that. You need to march, you need to stay active. Um, anybody here want to talk about cap and trade and carbon tax? Yeah, I thought so. Um, it's still very early, and things are going on behind closed doors. I'm not really privy to Jerry Brown's way of thinking, partly because I led a protest of him at the Caldem party a couple of years ago against fracking, <laughs> um, and partly because he's a hard guy to read and he doesn't um, let a lot of people know what he's thinking. Um, he is apparently making overtures to the oil companies. The basic lay of the land is this. Cap and trade expires in 2020. We passed SB 32, extending our general goal of climate um, policy and carbon reduction through 2050. However, thanks to unrelated stuff going on between the time that AB 32 was passed and the time that SB 32 was passed, cap and trade needs a two-thirds vote in the legislature. For the reasons that I've just outlined, it's going to be hard to get a two-thirds vote unless we have all of the Democrats, including those moderate oily Democrats, on board. Right now, one of four things is going to happen. Number one, we're going to pass Cap and a, a cap and trade extension as is completely untouched, just kick it out from 2020 to 2050. That is a possibility. Um, second, second possibility is the environmental justice groups have pointed out quite rightly some major flaws in the cap and trade system, like the idea that we can engage in carbon offsets by buying rainforests in Brazil when instead money should be used to benefit um, people who are on the front lines of carbon pollution. And so the second thing that might happen to cap and trade is that it might get tweaked to alleviate these concerns and it might end up as a better process. The third thing that might happen is that cap and trade will get thrown out completely and replaced with some sort of carbon fee and dividend. Yeah. The fourth thing that, will ha that could happen is that cap and trade gets thrown out completely and nothing. So I don't yet have a good sense of how these are going to break out because it just became obvious last summer that we are going to have a problem extending cap and trade. Brown basically tried to stick the cap and trade extension into SB 32. It didn't work out. Um, so this fight is just beginning. I will say this, that if you will be talking with or meeting any of the governor positions, the who's going to replace Brown is going to be the hottest political topic in California. Try to get your selected candidate to commit to your point of view early and often. So if you're going to be meeting with John Chung or Gavin Newsom or any of those other guys, make sure you talk to him. Lobbying the future governor is just as important as lobbying your current elected. OK? Um, have I run out of time yet? <laughs> OK. <laughs> 
Okay, I will make myself available for questions after this because I don't want to take up too much time. I am gonna say one last thing on the way in the subject of hard truths, okay? I know, I know you guys are very happy about AJ43. Resolutions don't count, okay? Sorry. Um, Doss Williams is an awesome guy and he's a total climate hawk and I would walk on hot coals for him. Um, in a few years ago, he also had a similar resolution called AJR 37 that prohibited coal from being shipped out through West Coast ports. And it passed the legislature with all of the Democrats in support and maybe even some Republicans, I don't remember. But it was a resolution, it was not a binding resolution. Then we had the Oakland coal terminal fight that is still going on. And we have coal being shipped out through Long Beach. And we have coal being shipped out through Stockton, where in Stockton, they don't, un they don't like your arguments at all because Stockton, they are desperate for jobs. And they don't, you need to talk to people in Stockton the way you guys can do very well about the benefits of saying no to coal. So I wrote a resolution um, called, that, that, was, that asked CalPERS to divest from coal around the same time, 2015. Um, that resolution ended up getting turned into a bill, SB 185, and I worked that during the summer of uh, 2015 and it became a law. And so CalPERS now has to divest from coal. Yeah. And I'm doing this because I want to emphasize that resolutions, I, I, know, I know you guys, your intents are good, but hard truths, resolutions do not have the power that laws do. I still say that I think you guys are awesome. I want you to keep on doing what you're doing. We're all on the same side. Thank you. <clears throat>